All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, that, what a wonderful presentation by Mauricio. Uh, fascinating to see that. I'm just, I'm thrilled to see that kind of thing. Um, I wanted to point out kind of the danger of, of something like what Global Good is doing. Um, not in a bad sense, but I think the danger for all of us that we fall into is we see an organization like Global Good and we kind of think, wow, look at everything that they're doing. Look at these huge initiatives that they have going. And we think that's pretty great. And then we kind of sit back and think, so they're handling it. They've, they've got it taken care of. And in reality, um, one of the quotes that I really, um, really love comes from somebody from around the year 950 BC. And the quote is, do good when it's in the power of your hand to do it. That's from uh, King Solomon, about 950 or so BC. Do good when it's in the power of your hand to do it. And I think the problem is today that most of us don't realize the power to do good that we have in our own hands to do some of these things. And I just want to give you two quick encouraging examples um, before I jump into this. Um, the first one, there's about 30,000 children in the world that are born with this rare disease where they cannot move their arms, hardly at all, just barely a little bit, but they can't use their arms. 30,000, you remember Mauricio's dot on the screen of, of the diseases that were being, uh, and it was just that tiny dot, that was 3.4 billion, that tiny dot. Think of 30,000, 30,000 children and babies who cannot move their arms. Who is going to help these 30,000 kids? Who can do that? I can. I can help 30,000 kids move their arms. So we started a little company and we made a nonprofit. You can't make money trying to make devices little exoskeletal devices that will help 30,000 kids move their arms. There's no money in it. So we started a nonprofit. The idea is, if it's in the power of your hand to do good, just do it. So I want you to write down these two examples and look them up. So the first one is magicarms.org. Look up magicarms.org. It's called Magic Arms for the World. And so the idea was, let's just do it. We don't have any money. We don't have any support. We don't have anything, but we know how to make an exoskeletal device and manufacture it so kids can move their arms. And then we can deal with the logistics of getting these things around the world and getting them on kids that need them. That's one example. The other example, write this one down. Um, this is from my hometown, Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's called Feed My Starving Children. How many of you have heard of Feed My Starving Children? This shirt right here. Fabulous that that many people have heard of Feed My Starving Children. One guy in the mid-1980s, one guy visiting Honduras sees all these starving children and thinks, who is going to help these starving children? Who can do this? I can do it. I can help these starving children. So he comes back to Minneapolis and he works with General Mills. And they develop a nutrition-dense formula for food that's non-perishable that can be shipped. And his sustainability model? None. No sustainability. He thought, I don't have any money. I can't get any money. I'm just going to do it. These kids need food. I'm just going to do it. And so he goes out there and does it. You know what his model for sustainability was? They were a Christian organization. Their model was, we're going to pray. And we're going to just pray that people will donate money to this organization. 28 years, they have been feeding hundreds of thousands of kids across the world. That's longer than the Gates Foundation has been in existence. One guy started an organization now that's worldwide that's feeding hundreds of thousands of kids. And what he realized was you can cure all the diseases that you want if the children don't have decent nutrition and their immune system can't fight off a disease. It doesn't matter if you vaccinate them or what you do. They're going to die because their immune system can't keep them alive anyways. They need proper nutrition. So feed my starving children, magicarms.org. Just inspirational stories about how you can do it these 30,000 kids, these other kids in these other disease states, they're waiting for you. You guys are the innovators. They're waiting for you. What's in the power of your hand to do? What is it that you can do that you can jump on and do? Now, I'm not advocating just jumping into it willy-nilly and doing it um, not smartly. I'm advocating do it smartly. And it just so happens that I have a presentation on how to do that. So. I was going to title this, um, 
you know, how to design your device. So back to the medical world and, you know, back to medical devices. So I'm from Kablooey Design. We're a small 14-person company in Minneapolis, and we invent, we design, and we engineer devices, mostly medical devices. This is what we do for hire. We are inventors and designers uh, for hire. So we spend our time, I've been doing this for 25 years, um, inventing and designing devices. So I was going to talk about how to, how to design your device so it gets used, but then I thought it can't get used unless it gets purchased. And it can't get purchased in the United States unless it gets reimbursed. So fast track all the way away from uh, philanthropy and third world um, countries, and let's go back to the United States for reimbursement. How do we do this in the United States for reimbursement? What kind of things do we have to pay attention to? And the neat thing is, is the principles that I'm talking about here today, they also apply to any other situation. It's all a process um, about you know, what you're going to design. It, you could apply these principles to a, a pair of exoskeleton arms for kids in third world countries. You could apply it to, to nearly anything. So the first thing that you have to think about Oh, great. Technology, there we go. Is how will your device get purchased? So these are some of the things that we have to think about before we invent or design something. We gotta ask ourselves, how is it gonna get purchased? It's really important to the design of the device, believe it or not, and you would be shocked and amazed at how many companies, even large companies, don't think this through um, before they launch into a big product development effort. It would, it would boggle your mind. Um, so we have to think about that. And in the past, how did things get purchased? This is how things got purchased in the past. Um, it was basically doctor-driven purchasing. And the idea behind doctor-driven purchasing was the decisions were made by the doctor liked it. If the doctor liked it, the hospital was going to buy it. They went on the, on the word of the doctor. Things aren't like that so much anymore. I mean, that was back in the good old days when uh, Medtronic was getting started and things were going on and there's stories there. But in the present, this is how decisions are made for how is a product purchased and how is it bought. We have group-driven purchasing. So many hospitals today, most of them, um, have what we call VACs, and those are um, value analysis committees, or if they don't have a committee like that, they're at least making their decisions the way that these committees make decisions. So you have to deal with a committee or committee mentality on how they're going to decide to buy your device. It's very important to know this before you even start designing and develop it. So what are, these, what are these groups looking at? What's important to them? Well, there's a couple of things. They're making their decisions based on the disease burden, based on the unmet need, based on the clinical value, and based on the economic value. So suddenly it's, it's a lot harder now to be an inventor and a, and a, and a designer and just make something a doctor is going to like because we have to think about all these things when we're designing it. So let's take a look at those. These four things, disease burden. What are they looking at? What's important for them to purchase your device about the disease burden? You probably can't read that from back there, but what they're looking at is global prevalence. How, you know, how big of an impact is this going to have in the world, like the Gates Foundation? Growing incidence. How, how many times does it occur each year? You know, how, how often is it happening? How severe is the disability? Um, that the, the people affected by this, how severe is that? Um, is there complex management right now to treat this condition or this disease or this situation? Wow, five minutes, great. <clears throat> High mortality and big health care costs. Okay, that's what they're looking at for unmet need or for disease burden. Unmet need, the absence of therapy, is there therapy there? Is there difficulty with the use? Are there limits in its efficacy? Is there discomfort with current devices? Is there high complexity risk? And are there care gaps? Those are the important things we have to look at there. For clinical value, is it innovative? Does it improve usage? Is it very effective? Is there long-term safety? Does it improve the health-related quality of life for the patient? That's a big patient-driven thing. And is there extensive evidence base for it? And then lastly, economic value. The price reflects the value. Is there a cost savings versus alternatives? Is there a low budget impact? Are hospital resources reduced? Is there a cost savings? And is there economic data across different regions? Okay, so suddenly we've got all the stuff that we've got to think about when we're designing something. So not only are there VACs, there's also health economics and outcomes research. So a lot of companies are developing their devices by doing this health economics uh, research. And there's some important things there too. The things that they're thinking about are patient adherence and budget restrictions. So the important things there uh, for patient adherence, is it a patient-centric design? That's going to drive adherence. 
Um, how about the human factors? That's gonna drive adherence. Ergonomics drives adherence. How about the semantics? Can the patient understand what they're supposed to do with it? And then the simplicity. Is it simple enough for the patient to understand? Those things drive patient adherence. We have to look at all those things when we're developing and designing a device. And then of course, budget restrictions. Does it re reduce hospital costs? Is there reusability built into it possibly? How about maintenance? How is it gonna undergo its maintenance? Uh, manufacturing costs, can we keep them down through innovative means? And how about modularity? Are there parts that can be reused, parts that uh, are saved or not saved? So we got all this stuff going on and yet we're trying to be innovative. We're trying to create an innovation. So with all of those constraints laying on us, well, how do we be innovative with all those kind of constraints? Well, one of the ways is through design research. And by design research, I, the way I define design research, all the activities involved in gathering sufficient data to enable the development staff to make informed decisions about the potential design of the object in question. This is my own personal definition for the purposes of this talk. Design research, so not technology research, but design research. So what do we do when we're doing design research? Because this drives the innovative design that overcomes all those obstacles. So a quick look into design research, I wanted to just share with you how important it is. And I like to use this little example of how important it is. So I'm gonna give you all a little pop quiz and engage your intellects here for just a couple of seconds. I want you to take a look at this list of random names. Oh, ran, I just blew it. <laughs> okay, let me walk you through how I normally do this without giving away the secret. I, I do this test in almost every city that I go to and the results are about the same. So I throw up this list and I ask people, what does this list of random words, I don't say names, what does this list of random words have in common? And I ask for a show of hands. I consistently get 10%, 10% of the people raise their hands and say they think they know what these random words have in common. Then I say, I tell you what, I'm gonna read that list to you. And then I verbally re say the words, Neil, Pierce, Doug, Russell, Hugh, Pete, Ben, Cy, and Jim. And then I ask for a show of hands, how many of you know what those have in common? And across the board, 50% of the people raise their hands, they now understand that those are men's names. And then I show the list again, with the words just spelled differently, and then everyone understands, 100% of the people understand that they were all men's names, just spelled differently. What's the point? The point of that is, when we have knowledge with one sense, like in that particular case, vision, you're, you were using one sense vision, your knowledge was limited. Only 10% of the people had a deep knowledge of what I was trying to do. But when you have two senses that are being used, multiple senses, in, ca in this case vision and hearing, it went up by a factor you know, to 50% of the people understood. The point is, is that with multiple senses going, you have a higher understanding and a higher knowledge base of what's actually going on. And that's what design research is. Design research is kicking in an extra sense. So when you go into a product development project, a new innovation project, you're gonna design and develop something, doing your design research ahead of time gives you those multiple senses and gives you that knowledge ahead of time. So here's our development process. There's where that research occurs in the process. And the kind of things that we go through um, in the process are very observational. So I like Einstein's quote, if I had one hour to save the world, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes finding the solution. And that's what design research is, is defining the problem. So we go through a number of steps. One of the things we do is ethnography as we're defining the problem. And we look for a bunch of things. So in, in this case, if it was a surgical device, here's the type of things we look for. We go into the surgical suite and you can see that the user's arms are entangling with each other. Or you can see the clutter that's in the environment that they're trying to use the device. Or you can see that there's a little bottle down there with fluid in it and that, that bottle needs to be accessed in order for the procedure to work. You know, we're looking for all of these kinds of things uh, when we do ethnography. So I wanna leave you with three things to think about when you're doing design research and you're developing your product. And then I'm done, so I think I can pull this off in one minute. Three things, first look for the needs surrounding the need. So what I mean by that is you, have a, you probably have a need statement and your need statement might be broad. Like say for instance, you're trying to, uh, your need is, is around heart attacks or angina or heart pain or chest pain. That might be the area that your device is working in. But there's a bunch of needs surrounding the need. 
And those are the things like, well, it's hard for a physician to do this, or it's difficult for somebody to do that when they're treating this device. It's those little things, and you create this list of needs surrounding the need, and that list becomes your criteria. So you've defined your product area, but you need to define your criteria, and of course, we use those as design inputs for the FDA. But your design research helps you define those criteria to get those design inputs to have a successful device. The second thing you want to do, of course, is you're going to look at competitive devices, and you've probably already done that, but you need to look and succeed where they failed. So you can do these, this charting with, um, with features and benefits that they have, and look where they failed and where they succeeded and why. You can learn a lot by knowing their story, not just looking at their device, but knowing the story behind the device. So we dig into that in our design research. And then collecting your design inputs at the end. So having this list of design inputs. So you found this pain point or this need, and it might have been, the need might have been, uh, you know, you've, you, you can't hit scar tissue when you inject yourself with this, and then you create a design input from that that says the device is gonna provide X way to, for the user to identify scar tissue while using the device. So you, you get this list of these criteria, and the important thing is having your design inputs match these things that you looked at in the beginning that were important to the people who are going to be purchasing your device. So it all ties back in. There we go. How was that? I would paraphrase. <laughs> That's the fastest I've ever talked. I would paraphrase Albert Einstein and say, if I had only 15 minutes to give a talk about design engineering and design research, I would have Tom Kramer do it. That was a nice job. Thank, Thank you. you.